Now the current socio-political situation the Undercity finds itself in is a curious one. Some folks wish to rise up against the Enforcers, some are ready to offer up the kids to appease the situation, some are looking to wait it out, some are undecided. Conveniently, no one points out the fact that the kids did actually commit a crime, and that the manhunt is 100% justified. Excluding the excessive use of violence. No one in the Undercity actually cares about justice or fairness. The only concern is protecting one's own ass and upholding the status quo. And on the other side of this conflict, despite Marcus's single-minded rage and general incompetence, he does bring up a valid point. You people down here are all the same. Mistaking arrogance for bravery. You think you're standing up for something? But we all know there is a crime behind every coin that passes through this place. The deal between Vander and Grayson has backfired in a major way. The people of Undercity have become complacent, indulging their most shallow impulses. There's easy money to be made, so why bother acting according to common rules of society, since no one is there to stop them? Who would have guessed that when you remove law enforcement from a community, then lawlessness will reign? Worse, the criminal body has already gotten used to being able to do whatever the hell they please, and they are going to do everything in their power to keep it that way. In his effort to keep his community safe and happy, Vander has accelerated its downfall. There is so much you could do with this setup alone. You could make an entire show centering around this one conflict, dive deeper to the lives and viewpoints of different people across the entire Undercity, perhaps some people see the situation for what it is, that the Undercity has in part created their own suffering, maybe some people see the governing from above as a necessary inconvenience, so many possibilities for debates and gripping drama, families and friendships falling apart, leading to a full-on civil war. It's a shame that the show isn't actually interested in examining this conflict to the fullest. It's more of a backdrop and catalyst for the rest of the plot. The only fates that truly matter are the protagonist and her close network of people. And we are about to have the major villain of the show arriving to the main stage anyway. All the potential for further complexity is going to disappear, and the kids will become victims, fighting against objective evil. In any case, Vi is galvanized by the past 24 hours. The fury that defines her existence is only growing stronger by the moment. You heard him, they won't stop, we need to fight back. And if you won't, I will. Seeing as Vander's lesson from before hasn't quite sunk in yet, he tries getting through to his daughter once more, this time picking a decidedly grim backdrop for the heart to heart, the place where everything began. What I don't understand is how you can work with them. We were here, we saw what they did. I know you want to hurt the topsiders for what they've done to us, but who are you willing to lose? Milo? Flagger? Powder. Vander is making a basic appeal to emotion here, since that's the kind of argumentation likely to be effective on an emotional person. However, he is neglecting the other obvious angle of the issue, the argument from reason. Why is nearing adulthood, the next few years, the choices she makes, will define the rest of her existence? Is this the kind of life she wishes for herself? Being a criminal, a petty thief, ending up in jail, dead in a ditch, never amounting to anything? Instead of wasting her life by being a purely destructive element in society, she should be focusing her energy into something constructive, developing herself, and try to put her talents to better use. No one will find happiness by actively seeking destruction. This is something that every parent should instill in their children. Not to mention that all things considered, Vi is leading a good life as it is. She is clothed, fed, she has a roof over her head, she is the daughter of the de facto leader of her community, she can continue Vander's work, 
tent the bar, protect the lanes, or do anything she likes. No one is stopping her, she has a fulfilling future waiting for her. All she has to do is accept it. You might even say that she is extremely privileged compared to the rest of her community. Absolutely no one is oppressing her at this moment in time. No one is restricting her from chasing her dreams, or telling her what to do, or how to live. Every current problem in Vi's life is created by her own actions. And we know that every position in society is open to anyone, even people of the Undercity, if they keep working hard enough. Victor is a living example of that. It's a matter of applying yourself. I grew up knowing I'm less than them. That my place is down there. I want Powder to have more than that and I'm willing to fight for it. What exactly does this mean? What more does Vi want? If pressed on this matter, I am 100% sure that Vi would not be able to provide an adequate answer. At least not one that wouldn't instantly make her a hypocrite. As she currently is, Vi is allowing her trauma to consume her fully. Horrible things happened to her, and she has never healed from that experience. Partly because her community isn't allowing her to heal. The culture of her peers states that everyone in the Undercity are eternal victims, and everyone topside are devils. Even though it's their own criminal element perpetuating their suffering, the people wallow in past injustices, and through that justify their own indulgence of violence and hatred. Notice how none of the kids feel any remorse for what they did. They blew up someone's home, accidentally or not, and they don't care. The morality of all this doesn't cross their minds even for a second. Vi knows nothing about Jace, yet she somehow decided that he deserves to get robbed. Jace has never done anything to hurt Vi, and Vi still hates him so much that she's willing to destroy his life. Why? Because Jace just so happens to live in the same place as the people who killed her parents. Guilt by association, that is the textbook definition of bigotry. Why is crying about being labeled a lesser person, while she herself treats other people as lesser? And here we arrive at an important fact about Vi's place in the narrative, even though she is one of the prominent point of view characters, and the main protagonist of the show, she is not the hero of this story. We all have a general idea of what constitutes a hero, in a storytelling sense. Heroes help people, protect people, nurture people, no matter who they are. They use their skills and resources to make the world a better place, even at risk to their own health and happiness. Basically, they act in a way that we would consider universally moral and ideal. Well, duh. On the opposite end of the character spectrum, we have the villain. Villains are those who trample on their fellow men to satiate their own selfish desires. They commit crimes, they steal, they murder, they lie and cheat. They use their power and influence in underhanded ways to gather more. For the sake of more, for themselves. They are what we would universally consider immoral actors. Well, duh. However, it's important to note that heroes are allowed the occasional fumble. Heroes can be fallible, they can have flaws, they might indulge their primal desires and make the wrong decision in a moment of passion. If we didn't allow heroes to have flaws, then the only types fitting the moniker of hero would be ridiculous, unrealistic, borderline, satirical, goody two-shoe boy scouts. What's important is that heroes realize when they make mistakes and feel remorse for them and work towards being better people as a result. Similarly, villains do not have to be pure degenerate feasting on baby corpses evil 24-7 in order to retain their status as villains. Even an otherwise horrid person 
can hold a few decent morals and is capable of good deeds from time to time, yet those positive attributes do not make them less of a villain. Otherwise, we would have to consider every genocidal despot who shows even the slightest empathy towards their underlings a hero. And that's not how any of this works. As such, the difference between a hero and a villain is not just about their actions. Let's say that generally, heroes do good for more than 50% of their existence, and villains do evil for more than 50% of their existence. Heroes are a net positive to the world, and villains are a net deficit, to put this into some kind of clean categorization. Outside of that, I would posit that the more important defining aspect between heroes and villains isn't the deeds that they do, but rather the motivations behind their actions. Heroes act the way that they do because of their firm moral fiber. There's nothing ambiguous about it. They help their fellow men simply because it's the right thing to do. As for villains, their motivations stem from their twisted view of the world. It may be because of trauma, it may be because of culture, it may be because of desperation. Whatever the trigger ends up being, villains see it as their right to do horrid things. The world is broken and I will make it right. Or the world is broken, I might as well indulge in it. They see the universe as a dark place and as such, their deeds are justified, no matter how heinous. They may feel remorse for the fact, but never enough to guide them to the path of righteousness. With all of that said, we also have the ones in the middle, commonly referred to as the anti-hero. For whatever reason, they do not seem to quite fit into either category. So what exactly defines an anti-hero? The answer is actually simpler than you might think. Anti-heroes have the motivations of a villain, but their actions end up resembling those of a hero. As an example, we have our protagonist Vi right here. Her motivations are completely self-centered, she seeks revenge on her enemies, and she wants to keep her friends and family safe. Her friends and family? If you happen to be outside that exclusive circle of individuals, you can jump off a cliff for all Vi cares. Every decision Vi makes is fueled by what she personally desires, and the society around her, the lives she may affect, the concept of justice and fairness, are none her concern. She uses her trauma as an excuse to lash out at the world and commit any crime she wants. This is not even about whether or not the audience feels sympathy to her plight or not. Her attitude towards life is that of a villain. And villains can be sympathetic as well, lest we forget. And here's a quick truth explained in full, in case anyone is confused. Taking care of your own family does not make you a hero. It is desirable, of course, you should do it, obviously. But by doing the bare minimum of what a human being is supposed to do does not automatically make you a hero. It may make you seem heroic in the eyes of those affected, but it does not make you into a hero in a universal sense. Especially when you help your own family at the expense of others. That's favoritism, not heroism. When given a choice, a hero is ready to sacrifice even their own flesh and blood for the prosperity of all. The need of the many outweighs the needs of the few, now and forever. So why has the motives of a villain, and yet she ends up not being one? How is that exactly? Arcane leans into the exact same reasoning as every other story with an anti-hero. The narrative introduces a threat of some kind, and the protagonist is forced to face that threat, usually a villain of greater machinations. The villain stands in the way of the anti-hero's desires, protecting her family in this case, and so a clash is inevitable. 
the plot is laid out in such a way that the self-centered motivations of an anti-hero end up manifesting in the same actions that a pure hero would take, combating a villain. Or to put it bluntly, an anti-hero is an asshole who just so happens to be fighting against an even bigger asshole. As a final note on this particular topic, it's vital to remember that any of these three character types, hero, anti-hero, villain, can develop into any other type as a story progresses. It's all up to the writer as to what kind of journey they wish to craft for their characters. However, throughout the first season of Arcane, Vi retains her anti-hero status firmly. A certain incident at the cusp of episodes 8 and 9 especially reveals that, when contrasted to the actual hero of the story, Jace. But that's still far in the future. Several hours of analysis in the future. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long. And a special thanks to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, Six Stars, Danny Kicks, and Adon Adaniel. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.